people do suspect the government of lying. After all, the, the evidence laid out there, even if you just uh, watch the mainstream media. As to whether they expect uh, the government to continue to lie and to, to have the consequences that we uh, have experienced, no, because they're brainwashed on a whole different narrative. It's always the Russians, the Russians, the Russians, the terrorists, the terrorists, the terrorists, the terrorists Iran, 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 Iran. They are, and I use the term advisedly, Judge, they are brainwashed. And so they don't realize what it is, for example, uh, for seven, eight years ago, this legend about the Russians hacked into the Democratic National Committee computers and gave us Donald Trump. Okay? They don't realize that that has been totally debunked now by court testimony. They don't know that. And so they can't appreciate the consequences. But the culture in your former place uh, of employment, uh, Mike Pompeo was, uh, of course, uh, military and then CIA and then a congressman and then the director of the uh, CIA and then the secretary of state. Is he right when he said the CIA's job is to steal secrets and lie about it? Well, he said that in a uh, unguarded moment out there at Texas A&M where he knew everybody would clap really loud. Uh, he was uh, he was having a little hubristic moment there. Uh, what he said was, uh, you know, we have all courses at the CIA and teaching us how to lie, cheat, and steal. I mean, it's really great. And everybody applauded. Well, you know, uh, yeah, that's what goes with the CIA overseas. What we try to do in the analysis part of CIA was tell it like it is. And that's why Truman set up the whole damn agency, right? So, yeah, uh, Pompeo is just the inheritor of a corrupt regime, malleable managers, I call them, put in place by Bill Casey and Bobby Gates, who would just salute if Casey said, it's the Russians that are responsible for all terrorism in the world, right? And there was a yes, sir, Mr. Casey Gates. Yes, I see five Rus Russians under those rocks in Nicaragua. They got promoted. They, in turn, promoted more people. And when you get to the rock fiasco, when Bush and Cheney made clear that they wanted evidence, they wanted some kind of reason to substantiate an attack on Iraq, well, we know that story. The American people don't know it very well, but they should know in a, in a word that after a five-year investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee, its chairman on the 8th of June, 2008 said, the evidence it's used to justify the war in Iraq was unsubstantiated, contradicted, or even non-existent period, end quote. That was a bipartisan decision by this by this uh, body, this Senate Intelligence Committee, and it was unanimous. So, you know, uh, that's the word right there. Uh, uncorroborated, contradicted, and even non-existent, his words. What's non-existent intelligence look like? Uh, this was the most profound sadness I had when I saw my my profession of intelligence analysis corrupted to that extent to justify a war of aggression. Did George uh, Tenet uh, tell the truth when he blamed 9-11 on the Saudis? You know, I don't know about that. Uh, I, uh, I have not, I've seen a lot of stuff. Uh, I know that he did not tell the truth about uh, about weapons of mass destruction. And I know that uh, he was responsible for having an estimate, a national intelligence estimate, uh, a fraudulent one prepared just in time for Congress to vote to enable Bush and Cheney to make war on Iraq. That is the document that Colin Powell relied upon at the UN. I think Colin Powell knew better, but he said it anyway. So. Tenet has disappeared into the woodwork. I don't know where he is now, but he should be brought up on charges of starting an illicit and in, uh, immoral and unnecessary war. Well, we know uh, that uh, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice 
were of the view uh, that Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction before 9-11. Somehow their opinions changed after 9-11. How do we know their opinions before 9-11? <laughs> well, Chris found these. Chris, let's run both of these clips. Colin Powell and then Condoleezza Rice before 9-11. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. Uh, we are able to keep arms from him. His military forces have not been rebuilt. A reflection there of a change. And that, many believe, was the truth, a truth that was covered up and conveniently forgotten after September the 11th, when Bush and Blair decided to attack Iraq. Why do you think they attacked uh, Iraq to uh, deflect attention from Bush's asleep at the switch on 9-11? Could you rephrase that? Why do you think we attacked Iraq to deflect attention from George W. Bush and Dick Cheney's regime being asleep at the switch on 9-11 or otherwise engaged on 9-11 or complicit in 9-11, however you want to look at it? Well, we know that the project for a new American century had Iraq at the top of its list, Syria, Libya. You know what happened to those folks, right? So this was something long in coming. Now, even those documents by these uh, neocons indicated that an explosive event, something that was really, really explosive, like a new Pearl Harbor, that would let them go much more rapidly into this kind of domination of that part of the world. So there is evidence out there. Uh, it's circumstantial evidence, and there's a lot of it. The question is, uh, they're going to they're gonna do Iraq anyway. It was a matter of time. And Iraq was really a function. You know, I had been asked at a congressional hearing, well, can you tell me why? Why they falsified the information when it's for Iraq? Well, yeah, there were three reasons. One, I used the acronym OIL, okay, O-I-L. Well, O for oil, I for Israel, and L for logistics, the, the, the bases, the permanent military bases that we coveted at that point in Iraq. Now, we didn't get the bases, okay? The oil, well, no, we didn't get much of the oil. Israel? Well, we, we removed the main threat to Israel as the Israelis saw it, and I b increasingly believe that it was that latter factor that had most influence in the decision. And I think the last several months has proved that uh, I've been accused of, uh, well, I was run out of the, <laughs> pretty run out of the hearing when these, all these Democrat uh, uh, representatives rose up and said, why could you, why would you say Israel? I say, I say Israel because CNN is on, C-SPAN is on there, and I'm intelligence analyst, I don't need any money, and I don't need any job in the mainstream media. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think when uh, Colin Powell lied to the uh, UN, when George Bush was looking for United Nations support for his uh, invasions, that the intelligence community knew he and Tenet were lying. Um, I'm 95% sure, <clears throat> and I know that from Colin Powell's closest associate, Colonel Larry Wilkerson, who has a book, which I do hope he'll publish soon, which recounts exactly what happened as they were preparing that speech at the UN. Uh, they were going to, they were going to dish away most of it. There was some of this stuff with respect to Iraqi uh, Saddam Hussein ties with Al Qaeda, rubbish. Okay, and they they went into this private room. This is from Larry Wilkerson, and Larry and Colin Powell said, "You know, this is crazy." There are no ties. Nobody says this except the Defense Department. Let's get that out of speech. They go back into the main conference room where I've spent many hours with George Tenet comes in. He's, oh, we have a new report. And then the report says, aha, yes, there were ties. Here's a, here's a great report. Now, it was a report done under torture, okay? Now, Larry rused the day that he said, now, wait a second, this is a little fishy. Uh, who is this guy and how did he, who did he tell the Egyptian services? Well, that would de facto was under torture. So the answer to your question, Judge, is Colin Powell had been around a long time. 
Uh, Larry, of course, is very defensive of him. Uh, and you know, Larry regrets that, they, that he didn't speak up either. But they were misled by Tenet. Uh, Powell chose the, the, the easy way, the professional way to join the crowd and lie through his teeth, 95% knowingly, in my view, before the UN, because he, maybe he was he thought that uh, I don't know what he thought, but you know this is what you, what happens when you get what what, what do you think most uh, intelligence agents thought? The intelligence they had been totally corrupted. They had instructions from Dick Cheney, who used to visit CIA headquarters around down the block from where he lived, and tell them what they should say. This is documented, and my great regret is that I know some of those guys that wrote that estimate, and uh, they're not they're not still ready to own up to the fact that yeah they were used and they were used in such a way as to justify an unjustifiable war. Now that clip, and let, let me just make a thing about that: the clip that you showed of Colin Powell in February two thousand and one and Condoleezza Rice in late July 2001. So same year that 9-11 happened in September. Now, they were telling the truth, okay? They said Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction, not even a threat to his immediate neighbors. And who found those clips? I didn't find them. We came out right on our, di our diagnosis, but, but the person who found that was John Pilger, rest his soul he died over the weekend and it's his voice you see on that clip saying yeah that was the story before 9 11 after 9 11 as everyone well knows everything changed so to finish up here before 9 11 saddam hussein had no weapons of mass destruction witness what powell and Congolese Roy said after 9 11 weapons of mass destruction descended from the heavens like manna to make a soft landing on Iraq where there was lots of oil that we coveted. I mean, hello. I had lots of mileage out of John Pilzer's uh, clip there as I uh, made lectures uh, right after I discovered them. He came in and interviewed me and I had done, not known who he was before, but I know now and he is, uh, he's a champion and I much regret his passing, but his example is there for all of us to see. His uh, documentaries especially are incredible. Here is uh, Colin Powell uh, before the UN. First, you will recall that it took UNSCOM four long and frustrating years to pry, to pry an admission out of Iraq that it had biological weapons. Second, when Iraq finally admitted having these weapons in 1995, the quantities were vast, less than a teaspoon of dry anthrax, a little bit about this amount. This is just about the amount of a teaspoon, less than a teaspoonful of dry anthrax in an envelope shut down the United States Senate in the fall of 2001. This forced several hundred people to undergo emergency medical treatment and killed two postal workers just from an amount, just about this quantity that was inside of an envelope. Iraq declared 8,500 liters of anthrax, but UNSCOM estimates that Saddam Hussein could have produced 25,000 liters. If concentrated into this dry form, this amount would be enough to fill tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of teaspoons. And Saddam Hussein has not verifiably accounted for even one teaspoonful of this deadly material. I don't think that date up there was correct because he wasn't the Secretary of State in 2015, but it clearly was Colin Powell. He was clearly before the UN, and clearly you saw was behind him, Negroponte uh, and Tenet, uh, almost as if to silence him if he didn't say what they had put in the speech. Well, yeah, that was the uh, a clip from the the five fe February um, uh, Colin Powell speech at the UN, and I'm going to revise my estimate from 95 percent to 100 percent. He knew he knew what was going on there, 
and he did it anyway. Why do I say that? Because our, our friend, Scott Ritter, was beating the doors down in Washington saying, look, I know from the, I headed up the team at UNSCOM, okay? Right. I know that they destroyed all those weapons uh, under UN supervision in 1996, and we have Saddam Hussein's son-in-law telling the UN, the British, and us that same thing. Now, Colin Powell could not have escaped knowing that, and of course, Ritter wasn't given the time of day, either by Colin Powell or by Joe Biden, who happened to head up the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee at the time. So, yeah, he had to know that he was lying. Uh, he became a cog in, in the wheel of the bureaucracy. It's really sad to see a person who, before that, I had sort of admired. I had I briefed him uh, every other morning before I saw his boss, Weinberger, I gave him, he was from the Bronx. We were friends. I'd give him a little insight into what I was going to tell his boss because that had to be one-on-one. -on -one. And he was, he was appreciative of that. But then to watch him do this kind of thing was really, really sad. But it is symptomatic of how captured you get by, by, the, by the bureaucracy and by the need to fit in with the rest of the guys. And he fit in with the rest of the guys. Talk to Larry Wilkerson about that. He knows all this firsthand, and maybe finally he'll publish that book. Let's bring this uh, up to date. Uh, Ukraine is uh, Ukraine war is effectively over. They have effectively lost. They are begging for cash uh, and military equipment. The Congress isn't going to give them any. The Prime Minister of Great Britain and the President of the United States are. Uh, according to the Financial Times and according to Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, contemplating stealing stealing Russian assets that have been frozen in Belgian uh, banks and converting those assets, I guess they're cash deposits or some sort of deposits, uh, over to uh, Ukrainian use. Just background to my question. Will the next lie be the war is a stalemate? See, we stopped Putin from reaching Kiev. Therefore, Joe Biden, I did a good job. Uh, Joe Biden uh, has not been truthful on all this. He's been very poorly advised. Uh, on your question about seizing those assets, there is no better way to shoot yourself in the foot internationally by doing such a thing. Now, the fact that this is being brooded about and contemplated, it, it sort of persuades me that Joe Biden is still calling the shots, for God's sake. You know, I, I had sort of dismissed the notion that he was, uh, he was one of a main player, but even Blinken and Sullivan and, and, of course, Secretary Yellen of the Treasury, you know, they must know what seizing Russian assets would do, and what would it be a stopgap, you know? There wouldn't be enough to, to fund what Ukraine needs for more than a couple more months. So when are they going to finally wise up and say, look, this is over. The fat lady is about to sing. Let's make the best deal that we can. Switching over to um, Gaza, is there any discernible military benefit to the uh, for for uh, for Israel, for the obliteration uh, of the Gaza Strip, and the genocide, exterminate genocidal extermination of the Palestinian people. There's no military benefit for it, other than the fact that once the Gazans are driven out of Gaza or killed, then Israel will feel a little bit more secure. There are two hopeful signs that I've noticed. Uh, some brigades, Israeli brigades, have been withdrawn from Gaza. And of course, the USS Gerald Ford has been called home to Norfolk. Uh, these are straws in the wind, Judge. But it's hard not to, to look at these things at face value and say, oh, so we're pulling out one of our aircraft carriers from the area? That's a good thing. So uh, Israel's pulling out some troops from, from Gaza? That could be a good thing, too. So. Again, straws in the winds, but let's not give up hope. Um, the Yemeni thing in the Red Sea is causing everyone to, to change their calculations 
Uh, and Israel is really suffering economically. Will the U.S. taxpayer keep Israel afloat at this this cost? I don't know, but I think Biden may be getting better exam better advice now with respect to the real present danger of uh, having aircraft carriers as sitting ducks out there in the Eastern Med. Here's um, a clip that we found for you, Ray. Nelson Mandela on the plight of the Palestinian people. I wonder what Netanyahu would think of this. One of the mistakes which some political analysts make is to think that their enemies should be our enemies. I explained to Mr. Sidney that we identify with the PLO because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. Many Jews, uh, members of the Jewish community in our struggle, and they have occupied very top positions. But that does not mean to say that uh, the enemies of Israel are our enemies. We refuse to take that position. You can call it being political or uh, a moral question, but uh, for anybody who changes his principles depending on whom he is dealing, that is not a man who can lead a nation. What do you think, Ray? Well, when you think about Nelson and when you think about Bishop Tutu, uh, where is the moral leadership today? Uh, I have an article up on my website today which talks about the unconscionable silence of church leaders, uh, whether they be Protestant, Catholic, whatever. Um, it's just, you know, a repeat of what happened in the 30s and 40s in Germany. Uh, moral leaders could not find their voice. Uh, Bishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela are dead. Have we no worthy successors? Great. Uh... Why they're so excited about widening this war in Gaza? What's the problem right now? Why they're not seeking a political settlement? Is that a sign of weakness? Is that a sign of winning? A sign of losing? Well, Nima, it's complicated, as you know. It has to do with infighting within the Israeli government, which is a very strange bunch of characters. And it has also to do with infighting within the American government, where also, if I may say so, there are a very strange cast of characters. Now, here's a, a straw in the wind. About a week ago, it was announced that the USS Gerald Ford aircraft carrier with its accompanying ships was being withdrawn, taken back to Norfolk, Virginia. I said to myself, huh? That doesn't really square with this uptick in tensions. So I filed that around. The next day, the Israelis announced that they're pulling out full brigades out of Gaza. I said, whoa, there's two straws in the wind. Uh, one has to be cautious, especially if, if one is still an intelligence analyst, not to jump to conclusions. But that told me then, and it tells me now, that not everybody is agreed in the United States government, as well as in the Israeli government, as to how to proceed here. Now, the Israelis, many of them, want to widen the war, witness the fact that they have been assassinating people. They have, in my view, been killing 100 and wounding 200 people in Iran uh, who have uh, who were actually participating in a memorial service for Soleimani, killed exactly four years before, and Trump bragging about it. Now, uh, that major provocation, and they're blaming it on ISIS, but 
Yeah, it's really hard to believe. ISIS has trotted out when somebody needs to be blamed for something. It was the Israelis, in my view. And what were they trying to do? Well, they're trying to provoke Iran into some kind of action where they can go to Washington to say, hey, those terrible Iranians are on. They're killing. They're, ki they're, 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 they're retaliating, so-called, but they're killing uh, Israelis and maybe Americans. Now, what am I after here? I'm saying that the Iranians are pretty clever people, okay? They know about the correlation of forces. They know what the remaining aircraft carrier, USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, what that is capable of doing. And so my guess, and it's just a guess, is that the Iranians will let rise to this bait, okay? So this Israeli provocation will not achieve what the Israelis really want to do, and that is to get the U.S. engaged military, militarily, so that they can pr prevail in Gaza, which I would add they are not doing. They are not prevailing right now. So if I'm an Israeli, one of those in now in the government, and this didn't work, in other words, we couldn't provoke Iran into doing something really stupid, maybe we ought to do it for them. Yeah. How about, how about a false flag attack? They still have one aircraft carrier out there in, in the Persian Gulf area. Um, hmm. Yeah. Let's make believe Iran does it. Let's kill a bunch of Americans. And then the people like Senator Lindsey Graham, who says, ah, once they start killing Americans, then we're going to obliterate Iran. You know? So now, do I think this is likely? I'd give it a 50% 50 50 chance because the Israelis are losing. Now, Another factoid here is that this week, the Defense Intelligence Agency leaked a report saying, hey, Israel, if you get involved in another war with Hezbollah in Lebanon, there's no guarantee you're going to win. You probably will lose like you did last time. Whoa, and that was surface to the press, right? What else? Well, there's the biggie here. And that is, what's today? Tuesday? In two days, there will be a meeting of the International Court of Justice, which has a complaint filed by South Africa saying that Israel is committing genocide. Now, I have not read the entire 84-page text of that complaint. But I am reliably informed by the likes of John Mearsheimer and others that is an airtight case, that the detail, uh, the ingenuity that went into putting this thing together is bound to prevail. And it's altogether likely that after the International Court of Justice looks at this and it's doing it in an expedited manner, of course, well, you know why, uh, that the Israelis will be found guilty of genocide. Now, <laughs> uh, you know, it's hard to connect these things all together, but that case was filed on the 29th of December. Uh, it's really come to coming to a head now, uh, together with the fact that... Uh, even the American intelligence agency, DIA, thinks that, that Israel will not win against Hezbollah, much less in a two-front war, for God's sake, in Gaza and Hezbollah. And the fact that the Israeli IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, are not much good for much more than shooting rockets. They're good at that. Dropping bombs, they're good at that. Not so good at infantry tactics. Why? Well, because they're mostly 
two-year trained people who do their active duty and then they go back to civilian life and and during their active duty what do they do well they suppress the palestinians in the west bank they beat them up they shoot some of them it's really not good practice for taking on a formidable foe such as hezbollah now my friend uh, and colleague uh, scott ritter made that clear from the very outset that hey watch now <laughs> the israeli idea is not much good for winning this war so where does that leave them well at least them in a very precarious position obviously because they can't get their act together at the top of the israeli government there's backbiting there's there's tantrums being being done there are people refusing to come to meetings and so forth and netanyahu i'll say just one more time has a personal stake in all this if he stops being prime minister he will lose his immunity uh, there's a very good court case against him and his wife for bribery and all other kinds of misdeeds he could end up in jail now is it the prevailing uh, influence here i would say no but it's a big factor when you're involved personally when you have this kind of stake and avo avoiding defeat then you just escalate and if you can depend on the united states well of course as netanyahu as he bragged 23 years ago now quote i know america it can very easily be moved moved in the right direction 80 percent of the americans support us that's absurd close quote period well it was absurd then it's still more absurd now because it ain't 80 percent anymore it's down to about well if you talk about the elite it's been down to about 50 percent. if you talk about the common citizens who are in 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 possession of real news down around 25 percent, in my view that's very important so as long as netanyahu and his cronies he can depend on unlimited american support well then they'll go on and do whatever they want to do the question is will they really wipe out two million cousins now they've tried to arrange it and in the in the initial stages of this, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, cooperated with them. It was the plan. It was all written down in one uh, Israeli think tank and leaked to the press. Here's the plan. We drive the Palestinians into the Sinai. Okay. What's left of them. Now we got all kinds of money, says Tony Blinken. We'll pay for the tents. We'll pay for the relocation. We'll get them out of the Gaza put them in the Sinai, and we'll, you know, figure who, what other country, maybe the Congo, or we send these people, as though these people were just ploys, as though these people were not even human, as those people were, as the defense minister called them several weeks ago, just human animals, okay? Well, you probably remember, Nima, what short shrift was given that plan by, <laughs> by the president of Egypt, who happens to ha happens to have rule over the Sinai, when Blinken proposed that to him, he went bananas. I mean, you could see it in, in the video. It was a very acrimonious meeting. Now the U.S. is saying, oh, that was a terrible plan <laughs> if they weren't part of it. In the no, no, we don't want to we don't want to displace a whole, you know, we don't want ethnic cleansing because that's very close to genocide. OK. So what's going to happen? The choices are unambiguously awful. Uh, how many more dozens that have to be killed in southern Gaza now before this thing stops? Well, maybe we'll get some word from the International Court of Justice because lots of people are involved, not least of whom are Americans who can be shown to have enabled, who have armed, who have given the political support to Israel necessary for this genocide. So it's a bleak picture, but there is some sort of 
light at the end of this tunnel. And my worry, of course, is that justice moves very slowly, even if the ICJ, Internet Course of Justice, moves very quickly, which so far they have. Yeah, how many thousands of more uh, Gazan Palestinian children, women, men, are going to be killed in this ethnic cleansing. So, yeah, that's where I see it now. It's more in play than before. Who are these people that decided to pull the USS Gerald Ford out? Well, I think those are people with a little bit more sense saying, look, maybe, just maybe, the Israelis will get a message here that our support is not 150% as they expect it to be, just maybe. And there were reflections in the Israeli press that the to give them pause for worry. It's really, really complicated. I hope I have thrown a little clarity rather than further, further dust on the situation here. Israel's finance minister said that there are two million Nazis in Gaza. When it comes to this type of rhetoric, that it's so bold, do you think, are they trying to convince the public opinion in the United States? Are they trying to convince Europeans? For what reason they're using such bold statements? I would say that uh, their first, their primary audience are Israeli citizens themselves. They have been propagandized. Most of them, very sad to say, are in favor of driving out the Palestinians or making them dead. They're subhuman people. They're kind of, uh, well, they're kind of how uh, under the Third Reich, uh, the Nazis viewed the Untermenschen, okay? Uh, the subhuman people, Slavs, Jews, and those kinds of people. Now, revenge, of course, is at work here for what what the what Hamas did on the seventh of October. But there's a lack of proportionality, complete lack of proportionality that everyone can see except the people in Israel. Now, you asked about U.S. media. Uh, as you know, Nima, U.S. media is disproportionately ruled and operated by Zionists. Do not blanch before the word. Just look at them. And our government, our government is primarily ruled by self-proclaimed Zionists. Joe Biden, first and foremost, saying, I'm proud to be the most the greatest scientist in America. Okay, well, I don't think he knows what that means. It's not Jewish, it's Zionist. It has to do with supremacy, uh, superiority. It has to do with uh, co considering other people less than the Jews who were promised this land, so to speak, and uh, are want to get rid of the Vermin, which is also a word that has come into view into vogue today, after uh, since since World War II. So, Zionists are Zionists. It's it's not the Jewish religion, which is a it's a completely different animal. It's a political philosophy started in the late eighteen hundreds and just kind of given given the British reason to get out of this uh, inhabited this uh, colony that they had there in the Middle East and give it to the Zionists and who cares who's already there I mean 750,000 Palestinians well the Israelis will know what to do with them and indeed they drove them out of the country mostly into Gaza and Jordan and Lebanon, and where else? Uh, well, Saudi Arabia has its share of Palestinians. There are as many Palestinians in the diaspora outside of, in the immediate area of the Middle East, 7 million is the last count, as they were within the occupied territories. And of course, there are another 
and uh, half a million in Michigan and and those those states as well. So it's a very very difficult situation. And Israel's not going to make it out of this one. It's not going to make it uh, unless it has a complete what's the word metanoia. You know, a Greek word. Okay, meta completely around noia noose uh, your your mind. So you take your mind, you'll. Flip it completely around, okay, 180 degrees, and you change your outlook and say, well, we're not really superior to other races. Uh, the Bible really doesn't say we should have the promised land because the second part of that verse, Deuteronomy 15, 4, says, so that there shall be no poor among you. Yeah, you should have this land of milk and honey. It will be yours so that there shall be no poor among you. Okay, that's the deal. I mean, you could call that a covenant. Okay, <laughs> That's the deal. I, even in, in Hebrew scriptures, and maybe I'll say just one more time, that the word in pre-Aramaic, uh, the Hebrew scriptures for justice denoted showing mercy to the poor. In other words, what was justice? The word for justice was, was showing mercy to the poor. And that's the best tradition of the Abrahamic religions. It comes down to what Jesus of Nazareth said, of course, and the prophet. One last thought here. Why is Hamas, why is Hamas so popular? Why, why did they beat the PLO handily? in the 2005 election. Why were they given Gaza? You know why? Because they, primarily, because they heeded the charge so that there shall be no poor among you. Christian scriptures would put it, take care of the widow, the orphan, the refugee. Why did Hamas have so many hospitals? Why was Hamas having so much support from the people who lived in Gaza? Well, the answer is not because everybody wants to, to kill an Israeli or to, uh, to mount the kind of attack that happened on October 7th. But I have to say that it was not unprovoked, uh, that there are reasons in history to suggest why when you run out of other options and the whole world thinks that your problem is put aside like Trump and his son-in-law decided to do, just forget about the Palestinians. Uh, that's what happens when you repress a people, a people that has every right to seek redress for their grievances going back to 1948 when they were evicted, all 750,000 of them, those that were not killed by Israeli forces, evicted from Israel proper. They were talking about raping of these young women of Israel. How did you find it? I want to know your take on this issue. Nima, um, the charge of rape is the most effective arrow in the quiver of intelligence operatives, uh, and, and in, in media, okay? Uh, for understandable reasons, rape is just beyond the pale. I mean, you can kill people, you can torture them even, but if you rape them, uh, okay. So what do we have here? We have a, a, a constant stream of charges of rape against people who uh, the media wants to charge with rape. Uh, take, for example, uh, Libya. Hillary Clinton's advisor says, hey, let's say that the bad guys, the Gaddafi guys at Libya are being given Viagra so that they can rape more Libyan women. Let's say that. And so Hillary said, sounds good to me. So that was the legend brooded about in those days, and we know what happened to Gaddafi. We know the bedlam that has happened after Gaddafi. Okay? 
Now, when I first heard, oh, these these Hamas people are are taking time out from this very quick attack to say, okay, let's let's take turns uh, raping the women, and I heard the defense minister, I think it was, saying, you know, we know the orders went out from uh, from the Hamas leaders, which commanders should rape which women. And I said to myself, oh, my God. And when we saw that in the Washington Post and the New York Times, I said, oh, damn, they're at it again. They're using the most effective quiver in the whole arsenal of this kind of defamation. I would mention also that's how they got Julian Assange. He didn't rape anyone. The women that were involved were beside themselves saying he didn't rape us. All we wanted was to get a a test so we could be sure that he didn't have AIDS. Okay. That was it. That was the finding of the UN Rapporteur for Torture. Okay. There was no rape there either. But getting back to Hamas. So there is a wonderful group of young investigative reporters. Uh, it's called the Gray Zone. Max Blumenthal heads it. And they have kinds of they have all kinds of contacts within Israel and some within Gaza itself. Max has written books about all this, okay? And they pursued this. They dug into it. There's nothing to it. Not one wisp of evidence. Matter of fact, some of the women have come out and say, no, no, that was made up. And even the New York Times had to delete what the defense minister said about every commander was given instructions as to which women to... <laughs> yeah, come on, all right? So they're going to take time out from... So it was it was foolish on its face. The problem is, as everyone knows, um, the bad news goes out. And people believe it, and then by the the rest by the time the rest of the people get their pants on uh, and say, "Well, no, this wasn't true." How many people in the United States believe that Hamas raped women? I would say more than fifty percent, because the New York Times doesn't put that in the headlines. It doesn't put the retraction. Actually, it didn't even retract. It just deleted what this guy said, as I if, if memory serves. So. So, in answer to your question, long story short, there was no rape that can be established or confirmed. It was all propaganda. Uh, the sorrowful thing is that it worked. Rape charges. Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guests. And in this case, no question, certified former CIA uh, analyst uh, who briefed, I think, what was it, five presidents or something? Uh, Ray, three. Three. And three. one of them, Ronald Reagan, you briefed, but it wasn't clear he was always awake or he was doing something else, sleeping. But you briefed him from 81 to 85. You did President Ford, President Nixon. Uh, you were a Russia expert. You actually went to school quite close to where I grew up. And then I went to school at City College in New York, in Harlem, but you went to Fordham University, and we overlapped, and you were in ROTC, you went into the Army, and then as part of the, when your military duty, you were assigned to the White House because of your language skills and knowledge of Russia and China, and anyway, you ended up being the very important uh, chief of Russian analyst section, right, in the CIA. The reason I wanted to talk to you is we're at one of these moments in history, really frightening, where people are arguing about what is history, what is truth, where, what do we know? And we've had this discussion about the Ukraine and Russia, and we've had it endlessly. Uh, what can we trust in the way of information, of fact, what have you? And here we have a narrative that, about Israel and Gaza. And you wrote an interesting article. You said, wait a minute, what is this Europe pretending they have nothing to do with this? The whole reason for Israel was a grotesque uh, distortion of history, a grotesque uh, genocide atrocity they call the Holocaust, visited upon the Jewish people and many others, uh, but certainly uh, stressing the elimination of Jewish people, one of the most, maybe the most horrendous event in modern history done by Europeans. Uh, and the ironically, right now as we speak, here is 
was Germany, the country who gave us the Holocaust, and they're now arresting people if they demonstrate in Germany uh, for Palestinian rights. And they feel totally self-righteous. And they're the second largest arms supplier to Israel. So this whole narrative about who are these Palestinians, what is Israel, what is security, gets, becomes a garbled history. I want to begin with Israel's occupation of uh, Gaza and the West Bank and something called the Six-Day War. By then, you were functioning as a full-fledged analyst in the CIA. The official story that Israel put out to the world was they had been attacked uh, or were about to be attacked by Egypt and by Jordan and, the, uh, and Syria and the allied Arab powers, and they had to defend themselves. And as part of their quick victory, in fact, they hadn't been attacked. I read this quite recently in an article by you, but it's a familiar history, and Menachem Begin even admitted it, the former leader of Israel back in 82, I think, uh, that this was a war, a war of choice, it was a preemptive strike. And as a result, the Palestinians, who had nothing to do with attacking Israel, who had been occupied really by Jordan, by Egypt, and by Syria, and uh, denied any statehood, they in fact came to be under Israeli control. And so Israel's bombing of Gaza now and their control of the West Bank is something that came out of a war of conquest that they claimed they were waging to protect themselves against Egypt and Jordan, but actually they ended up occupying the Palestinian people. They made their separate peace with Egypt and Jordan, and now it's these Palestinian people who are being blamed for everything, and they are the subject, and one can argue about you know, the degree to which this represents genocide uh, against the Palestinian people. So how do you see it? And how did you see it when you were in the CIA at the time of the Six-Day War? Well, Robert, there's no argument about genocide. It's a textbook case of genocide. We know what happened to most people think six million Jews uh, back during the Third Reich uh, are two million, uh, did I say six thousand? Six million Jews are two million uh, Palestinians uh, any less important? I'd like to go back two decades earlier when you and I were callow youths in the Bronx, okay? I remember, I was nine years old and you were probably 10 or 11, you're much older than I am. And I remember the rejoicing that Israel had its own homeland. My God, it was great. There were parades up and down the Grand Concourse. Maybe you remember that. Nobody yeah. told us, nobody told us that there were people already there. Like, not only for centuries, for millennia, okay? They were called the Palestinians. They were driven out. Most people say between 700 and 750,000 of them were driven out by the Israelis so that they could occupy this land without a people, so to speak. So it goes back to, to then. And uh, of course, uh, as I learned these things later on in life, as I got a little bit better educated, I joined the CIA. And then let's fast forward to 1967. Uh, the the, uh, the Israelis were all powerful there in the Middle East. I remember analysts in the CIA sort of dissing the Arabs as incompetent. Uh, you know, they, an Arab tank had uh, four gears, uh, uh, three reverse and, and one forward in case of an attack from the rear. You know, this kind of joke about the, the, the Arabs. The Jews were supreme. And then, of course, in 1967, they put out this word that they were about to be attacked by the Egyptians and by the Syrians, and so they had to defend themselves. Well, <laughs> we know that wasn't true, but we weren't allowed to say much about that because it was very sensitive, even in, in government, to say, well, the Jews were lying about this, the Israelis were lying about this, okay? Now, during the 1967 war, when the Israelis did take, take after Egypt, and after Syria and destroyed their air force on the first day, then they were going up on the Golan Heights in Syria to take that. And they knew that the U.S. disapproved of that. They knew that the U.S. was intercepting messages between the armed forces in the Sinai and the ones in Tel Aviv, and they knew that the 
the, the, the ship, the intelligence collection ship that was collecting those signals, it was called the USS Liberty. So long story short, they tried all they could to sink it. Luckily, a sailor got an SOS out and the Sixth Fleet came to the rescue. The Israelis got out of Dodge. Well, let me just say 34 U.S. sailors were killed, 171 wounded. Most of the crew actually were wounded. So that was part of this of this uh, attack. Now, why? Well, because the Israelis are much, you know, they're much more comfortable asking for permission. Uh, I'm sorry, for asking for forgiveness rather than permission. They knew if they told the U.S. that we're going up in the Golan Heights to take that from Syria now. We said, no, no, it's not a good idea. You got enough now. And they went up. And they took it. Now, uh, as you pointed out, in 1982, when the Israelis were still riding very high, you know, Menachem Begin, the, the former prime minister of Israel, was talking at the National War College in Washington. And he was very expansive. And one of the paragraphs that he said, I'm going to read to you, and I have it up here on my side of my thing, so I'm not going to misspeak. Here it is. In June, 1967, we had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations and the Sinai approaches do not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. Okay, end quote. Now, so there you go. Um, that's what happened in 67. It was a a, a war of choice, as we're accustomed to say, like the one we did against Iraq. And they ended up with the West Bank, parts of Syria, the Golan Heights, and Gaza. Now, they had the Sinai as well, but under a separate deal, yeah, they gave them back Jerusalem to too, the uh, Arab. Oh, country. yeah. Well, the, Jerusalem, they got, got a slice of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was not given completely to the Israelis. They did take it over, but uh, it's an international city even today. So so the reality is that they did this, that they had carte blanche to do it, uh, that they were given forgiveness, if not permission, before they went up on the, on the Golan. And that's the situation that exists today with a president who thinks that he's, well, he, he shows himself as being you know, joined at the hip with Bibi Netanyahu, and it looks like Biden is actually making the decisions on this because they're crazier even than the ones Blinken and Sullivan would have made. We're so isolated, and this is not going to come to a, well, as the Chinese used to say, it's going to come to a, a no good end for us and for Israel. Things are escalating now. And I have to say that uh, the, the Arabs, the Turks, and the Iranians have what we call escalation dominance in that part of the world, just as Russia has escalation dominance vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. I don't know who's running our policies, but when Putin calls them crazy, I guess that's one thing I would agree with Putin on. They are crazy. Two-front war, Far East as well as Ukraine, and now this in the Middle East. Crazy indeed, and I just hope it doesn't get out of hand as it may since uh, someone blew up a uh, hundred Iranians, killed a hundred Iranians today, and um, you know wounded another another hundred, uh, another two hundred actually, and uh, the hand behind that is uh, is suspect to well, it seems to be Israel. Israel has not even denied it yet. Uh, we'll see how the Iranians react. They have been very cautious. I hope they continue to be cautious, but there's a chance. There's a chance of another false flag. Let's say somebody sinks the carrier that we still have, the Eisenhower, sinks it in the Persian Gulf or the Med, wherever it is right now. That would be blamed on whom? Israel? No. <laughs> that would be blamed on the Iranians. Well, well, and then the neocons will have their war. Yeah, but let me cut to the chase here in terms of the imagery of virtue. And again, it's, it's almost a sort of biblical proportion. Uh, and we have, you know, heads of our, some of our leading universities lose their job. The head of Harvard just today as we're recording this, uh, yesterday, uh, head of uh, University of uh, 
Pennsylvania, uh, wh what is being said is that, uh, and it's interesting because you think that the Arab world, so-called, holds the high cards militarily, perhaps. But I happened to be in Gaza and in the West Bank at the end of the Six Day War. I had been in Egypt. I was trying to cover uh, the the war. It ended uh, before there was much coverage to do. Uh, but the human tragedy here that you could basically imprison millions of people in the West Bank and Gaza and so forth, deny them their fundamental rights, and yet feel that whenever they fight back uh, using you know, and, and war and horrible means and so forth, as was done in this case in, uh, uh, two months ago, nonetheless, the idea that you had the right to imprison these people, deny them their fundamental rights, seize their ancestral lands, uh, and you did it in the name of your freedom, your security, right? And the whole reason for the establishment of Israel, and this was where your article I thought was really quite profound, uh, was done in retaliation to barbarism in Europe and not Muslim barbarism, but Christian barbar mm -hmm. barbarism. And and I want to get to the heart of that, that, that uh, here are people being subject and not just in the last bombing and everything but for decades of their their absolute fundamental rights and they did not attack israel they did not have an army they did not have an air force and that in fact the supposed sponsors of them in egypt and jordan didn't really have any affection for them or protection for them and then israel after picking this fight then made peace with them and actually was in just on the eve of this was in the process of getting along maybe better with Saudi Arabia. Maybe, you know, so this is not about the Muslim religion. This is about the denial of any essential humanity to people called Palestinian who happen to be living there. Is that not really the issue? Well, it is the issue, Robert. Um, Palestinians have been denied their rights uh, since 1948. That's why I went back that far. Uh, they've been driven, well, there are as much, there is as many Palestinians driven into neighboring countries as there are living in Palestine proper. Uh, Seven million each is what I'm told. In Gaza, 2.3 million is what most people say. And the clear intent of the current Israeli government is to get those people in Gaza either dead or driven out of Gaza into the Sinai, okay? Now, the White House is making nice noises now about, oh, we don't really like this language about driving people out of their homeland. Uh, but this was precisely uh, the, the case that, Secretary of State Blinken made to Egyptian President Sisi right after that October 7 attack by Hamas. He said, look, we got here's the solution. We had it all worked out. We drive out the, the, the Palestinians from Gaza, put them in the Sinai. We'll pay for the tents. We'll get them repatriated. We'll send them there wherever. Just let us get them out, of, get them out into Egypt. And Sisi said, you're kidding me. Get out of here. I mean, it was a very acrimonious. Know, but we're talking tell by... in a light way and about about you know, as you said before, genocide. We're talking about putting millions of people to flight, uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, destroying them, and having done so for uh, all these decades. And I want to take it back. Uh, because the, the imagery of you, you can't talk about the Holocaust or the Holocaust justifier. We're preventing another. All of this imagery, I want to take you back uh, to when we were young uh, and World War II. And we had the Holocaust then. And by the way, most of that during that war, it was not reported on very widely. Sure. We were not informed about the true tragedy. Our own government was rather late to get involved in World War II. And people who were shouting the cries about the, the heinous behavior of the Germans were sometimes considered, uh, you know, uh, 
of uh, irresponsible leftists or something. And we had very powerful figures in our own country apologizing for Germany. But nonetheless, at the by the end of that war, when it began to sink into true barbarism, and it, as I say, it wasn't only the Jews. There were you know tens of millions of Slavic people killed and everything else. Uh, this horrible thing. There was a kind of growing consensus that Germany should never be allowed to be a normal nation. Uh, that, uh, there was the Morgenthau plan to separate Germany and permanently dismember it. There was a separate occupation between East and, and, and West and so forth. And this is something you would know about because you've studied the military. Very early on, uh, many of these Germans were recruited to be part of the U.S. in this emerging Cold War and to develop our missile system and to work with us. And we really never had, unless you remember it differently, any serious discussion of how did one of the most enlightened Christian, uh, technologically advanced countries, maybe the most in the world, Germany, uh, authored this barbarism. And instead, the whole discussion has moved to what Muslims do or to Arabs in Israel or Palestine. And I want to take you back to that. How is that engineered? How, what, what, how can it possibly be uh, that somehow in response, and this was the point of your article, in response to this European destruction, and one of the things, by the way, we have a lot of sympathy for Ukraine. You point out that there were more Ukrainian prison guards than any place else from outside of Germany, I guess. Uh, you know, there, there was culpability by France. There was culpability certainly by Italy, by Hungary, by Poland in, in all this. Uh, how did we go to the situation now where a sanctimonious Europe wants to arrest their own citizens if they come out and protest for Palestinian rights? Isn't this really one of the more bizarre historical moments? It is, Robert. And, uh, you know, I know something about Germany. I lived there for two tours, a total of five years. I visited there often. I have a lot of really close German friends. When I, when I asked them, how could you, paraphrasing your own words, the most cultured, the most advanced society in that period of the world, how could you sit back and let this happen? And uh, they would usually say, oh, I fought on the Eastern Front against the Russia, the bad Russian. Or they would divert the conversation because there is no answer. They caved. Uh, one author described it as sheepish submissiveness. Try to say that together, a, a practice. Okay? That's what happened. The Germans caved. And they had a chance to speak out against Hitler. And they didn't. And that's what's sort of happening now, because in our country, nobody can speak out for the Palestinians without being branded anti-Semitic or, you know, worse. Now, going back to Germany, you know, after the war, uh, and I remember, you know, I was six, seven, eight, and you were a little older. As I say, you're much older than I am. Uh, after the war, uh, the question was, what do you do about Germany? Morgenthau said, well, break it up. Don't let this happen again, for God's sake. Give the roar to, to France and, and have a, have a demilitarized zone. He was the Secretary of Treasury, right? In the <laughs> Roosevelt yeah, administration. right. Yeah. Under FDR, yeah. It was, it was called the Morgenthau Plan. The permanent exactly. Plan. And the other thing that did come out of it was that Germany should not rearm. And now we right. are absolutely thrilled and encouraging <laughs> Germany to build up a big military force, as we're doing with Japan, ironically, the two Axis powers. We want them to be militarily stronger. And as I say, Germany here, their response is, oh, we'll, we'll give Israel whatever arms they want. Yeah. I mean, how, well, how did they end up uh, changing the whole narrative that somehow the Palestinians are, are labeled with anti-Semitism, are labeled with the horrors of World War II and, and the Holocaust, and these Europeans get off scot-free. Now, Robert, you're not a Catholic like I am, so you can't appreciate the concept of guilt <laughs> like I can. Hey, as long as you bring it up, Ray, the last time I interviewed you, I got in trouble with some listeners. <laughs> But I told a personal story when I was very young during this very period we're talking about, 
I can't remember whether it was five or six or so, uh, but the war was, you know, on. Uh, maybe I was a little older, maybe I was eight or nine or so, but some kid punched me in the nose and he said, you killed our Lord. And I didn't know what he's talking about. But when I got back to my neighborhood, uh, you know, I said, what was that about? And they said, oh, they think we killed Christ. And it happened that my mother was Jewish. My father wasn't. My father was a German uh, Protestant immigrant. But nonetheless, I, I, then my first response, the next time I encountered anti-Semitism, which was quite uh, widespread, uh, I remember wanting to say only half of me, you know, uh, but that didn't work. <laughs> and, and, but it is interesting because it wasn't until many years, and I went to Germany, not the way you did. I wasn't serving there, but I wanted to find my else. I went to Lithuania. I went to Russia, trying to figure out how did this happen? How did this happen? And, uh, you know, the role of civilization in condoning this, the very thing that Hannah Arendt wrote about and others, uh, uh, was it wasn't just they were sheepish. There was a justification that, the, the, first of all, there was a scapegoating, as there is with the Palestinians. They're responsible for all of our problems. There was a failure to deal with the inadequacies of your own society. Uh, there was a dehumanization. They've weakened us. They weakened our economy. They took advantage. Of, you know, so uh, this we see now uh, developing an atmosphere where it's okay to make refugees of an entire Palestinian population and kill a very large number of them, uh, women and children uh, led by. Uh, so I really want to visit that, uh, that, that, that attitude. How, how did it happen that the Holocaust became... Uh, not something that shaped our behavior in that part of the world, but rather and holding people accountable and trying to learn the lessons because we certainly got into mass violence in Vietnam and elsewhere and killing innocent people on a large level. You know about that. You were in the CIA. But somehow we're always able to blame another rather than our own dominant culture. How does that work when you were in the CIA? Did you know that the Six Day War was a fraud? Oh, sure. Yeah, we could we could tell the, the Egyptian concentrations in the Sinai didn't didn't uh, amount to a hill of beans. I mean, we saw the Israelis do what they did, and as I say, our analysts applaud. Oh, all those Israelis—they are all powerful. Those Arabs can't do a thing, you know. Let me go back to the anti-Semitism. You and I both grew up in the Bronx, Bronx and uh, there was anti-Semitism there. We Irish had uh, arrived uh, a generation before, and there were there were jokes and all that kind of stuff. And I heard that stuff, and it didn't didn't really impress me as being as noxious as it was and as it still is. So. Anti-Semitism is something very real. I like to cite Doris Kearns Goodwin's book about FDR and Eleanor. Eleanor says, uh, Franklin, there's a boatload of Jews off the, the coast of Virginia. Let's give, them, let's give them visas so they can escape. And Franklin says, no, no, we're not going to do that. And she says, well, we have to do that. He says, no. So she gives them... She gives she gives them the, the the visas anyway because she's Eleanor Roosevelt. Now Franklin was asked about what about this. Well, the answer was of course uh, it was wouldn't be a very polit very clever political thing to let a bunch of Jews in the United States, and that's what happened. More than one ship was turned away with boatloads of Jews. So and when I talk about guilt, it was sort of a joke, Catholic guilt, but it's American guilt as well. And the British, of course, not only guilty, but Machiavellian and saying, you know, let's get rid of these, these Zionists. And Zionists goes back to the end of the, the 1800s, right? So these Zionists, they want a place. Let's, let's carve a place. We have a mandate in Palestine. They want to go there. Let's carve it out. They didn't have any, any sense of, of doing justice to the Palestinians. So that's one thing. Now, um, the other thing that I have to really mention here is is white supremacy. Now, we know the, the Nazis were racists. 
A lot of us are too. Let's face it. Uh, what's the big divide in the world now? It's the lily white West uh, embodied in NATO, okay, against the rest of the world. What's what's particular or peculiar about the lily white West? They're white, okay, look at them all. The Turks may be a little blend, okay, but they're white. The rest of the world, 80% people of color. You can include Russia in there. You're really isolated in this white supremacy sort of thing, but it still reigns supreme. Uh, Biden still says we are the strongest. We're talking about the American, the United States of America, the strongest country that ever existed in history. Did you hear that? Ever existed in history. So this is the supremacy, and part of it is racial, and part of it is uh, what uh, superiority or su supremacy is the right word. I had to copy it down here because I get superiority and supremacy mixed up, and it's supremacy that's working, worked in Germany, and it's now working in the Israeli government, supported by other white folks who consider themselves not only exceptional, but indispensable. So that's how I uh, kind of uh, look at uh, how, how this can all be possible. There was guilt back on. Now, now we're so committed to defending our ally. And our ally, Israel, by the way, is not an ally. I'm going to explain that to you later. It's not an ally. You have to have a defense treaty with another, another country to be an ally. Okay. So we're so interested. We're so committed to defending that. Why? Well, you can't get elected in the United States if the Israel lobby puts its money for your opponent. That's proven true now in primaries, for God's sake. Okay. So. Money is getting people elected. It's getting people removed from Congress. Money is, is funding what remains of the mainstream media, uh, heavily, heavily influenced by Zionism. And of course, if you go to our government, uh, our president brags about being a, a Zionist. Does he know what that means? Does he know what being a Zionist has nothing to do with a Jew? It has everything to do with supremacy and considering other people, as the Israelis have just said, human animals that can be done with what we wish. So we're in quite a fix now because, as I said before, I'm beginning to think that Biden is really making the decisions now. He's got his head screwed up wrong on this, and it's not going to be long before there's a flare-up in the Middle East, whether it's in the Red Sea or whether it's a false flag attack blaming the Iranians, and then the people who are ruling our country, the other, the other um, people who are uh, in, in this frame of mind, Nuland, Secretary Newland, uh, Sullivan, Lincoln, they're all Zionists, and they're going to try to persuade Biden, well, okay, you said you defend Israel, you got to defend it against Iran, and the best thing we need to do is go after Iran. Uh, what I fear is there'll be a false flag attack blamed on Iran against the carrier that we have now still in the area, the USS Eisenhower. That will be blamed on Iran, and the... the uh, the impulse will be, okay, Joe Biden, you said that you divide Israel for as long as it takes. Now we got to go in with ground troops, so we got to go in real big and defend Israel because they're entitled to their own state and uh, blah, blah, blah. So it's really, really a very dangerous situation, especially because of what happened today. Now, yesterday, a very prominent top leader of Hamas was assassinated in Beirut. Today, more than well, 100 uh, Iranians were were killed and 200 injured at a celebration for Soleimani. He was the guy that Trump ordered to be executed in Baghdad, okay, uh, because he was planning an imminent terrorist operation. Guess what he was really doing in Baghdad? Two days later, the prime minister of, of Iraq said, Look, he was here to talk with me about a rapprochement between our countries and Saudi Arabia and other countries, Syria in the area. That's what he was here to do. He wasn't planning any terrorist operation. So 
So here's Soleimani. That was exactly four years ago. They're having a, a, a what a memorial for him, and there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people there. These bombs go off. The Iranians so far are saying we're going to find the perpetrators and we're going to punish them. Uh, so far, the Iranians have shown a judicious restraint. I don't know if they'll be able to do that much longer. This is pretty much a provocation that they will not be able to avoid. And my real fear is that the Israelis will make up something and do a provocation and blame it on the Iranians. And then we in Washington will be totally uninformed, misinformed, and bless our, our president and say, yeah, well, go ahead, put, uh, put U.S. forces in that area because we have to defend Israel. Well, so the pressing point on which to end this, but I, I want to challenge one thing you said about the racism aspect, uh, because, of course, there were the population of Israel has changed and there are more people living in Israel who are not necessarily white, who are Jewish, uh, and they uh, have a quite similar history uh, to other people in other Arab countries that they are from. Uh, and uh, uh, or uh, neighboring countries, well, you mentioned Iran as a, a, you know the whole per Persian Empire, and the irony here is that Netanyahu is able to appeal more to that religious oriented group or people who were actually you know uh, sometimes treated very shabbily in, in the uh, Arab and in the Persian world, not always. Uh, but somehow that all, I want to get at, how do you have a rational discussion? That's what I want to talk about. You, We started out with the sort of play in words about intelligence. We have the Central Intelligence Agency because you folks are supposed to figure things out in a rational, informed way. Hopefully, uh, people on the free press side, I put myself there, we're supposed to be doing our homework. We're supposed to be thinking about things and sort it out, you know. And uh, I think the bottom line here is what information can you trust? This is really what is so confusing, because I must tell you, as naive as I was then, when I was running around as a lone reporter, I was with Ramparts magazine. I was, you know, yes, critical. I talked to a lot of people, but nonetheless. It never occurred to me before I went, when I went, I started to see signs of it, that this was a staged war. I actually, at the start of it, thought, well, Israel was attacked, that there was somehow a, a justification of this. Mm. I'm being honest about it. I didn't have mm. all the CIA information. And the first shock to me on this was I landed at the Cairo airport. It was hard to get in. I happened to be with somebody who was Arabic speaking, who helping me get in. I had some of my doubts about whether I was going to get out. And we actually were held at gunpoint for hours that first night until somebody said, no, no, they actually have, were invited to come, uh, you know, uh, rather than that we were going to do. But the interesting thing was at the airport, the Israelis had managed to, they were very proud of it after, when I got to Israel, I had people bragging about it. Uh, they only hit the real planes, not the dummy planes. There were fake planes and so forth. They had such deep knowledge of Egyptian intelligence, of the Egyptian military. They knew exactly who the different people. And they had bought off a lot of people or had deals with a lot of people and so forth. And so the David Goliath uh, image collapsed those first weeks that I was in Egypt. It, it was bizarre. You know, where was this military monolith? You know, and really the problem with Nasser was he was a nationalist and he had nationalized the Suez Canal before and he was challenging British and French colonialism. All of that was left out. He really wasn't that focused on what was happening with Israel and the decision of Israel to be allied with Western colonialism was what tricked it. But the amazing thing is there was an idealism to Israel uh, and the old Labor Party and the, some of these people were leftists and so forth, uh, which has all been wiped out. And this is now a different Israel. 
I wonder if whether you have that same sense. And it's very difficult to know where does the religious part, which after all does not uniformly endorse creating your own uh, second coming, uh, and where is it old-fashioned nationalism? It, it, and my only concern now in talking to you is do we have any smart people, informed people figuring this stuff out in the CIA? and that the president might listen to, or the people in the State Department? My answer to that, Robert, is probably not. And there's a history to that. The analysis division of CIA was corrupted uh, a couple, well, one generation ago, and has never recovered, uh, to my knowledge. That's, that's why... We, uh, the president could be told that uh, Russia had already lost the war in Ukraine. Can you imagine? It was 180 degrees away from reality. So, no. What you have to do is look for people like, uh, oh, uh, uh, people like John Mearsheimer, uh, University of Chicago professor, and people like uh, Sachs, Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia, the people who had their head screwed on right, who have been around for a long time, and who have a really solid record of speaking truth to power. Now, the irony, of course, is that these people are well known in circles that are really interested in the truth. But when I asked John Mearsheimer, who nine years ago said, Ukraine crisis is the fault of the West, and explained out exactly how it happened and what would happen, namely that it would end up destroying the country of Ukraine. I asked him, I said, John, this is about a year ago. John, you were in Washington just last week. Did anyone get in touch with you to, to consult with you, to, to ask your opinion on anything? He said, he said, Ray, are you kidding? He says, no. He says, Ray, I've been in this business 35 years. No one in Washington has ever asked me for my opinion on these things. Now, he is the dean of the realist school of uh, international relations, okay? Widely respected. Now, in my day, we had enough humility to, to get these guys in a room, invite them and talk to them, even if they were devil's advocates or they devil themselves or they had really contrarian opinions. We wanted to hear them. Now, they don't even try to talk to these people. They're under this little kind of supremacy little thing, and they're only going to tell President Biden what he wants to hear. And my great regret is that this guy, what's his name, uh, Bill Burns, uh, who uh, is head of the CIA now, and is not a dumb guy. I mean, he's not a dumb ass at all. I mean, I know him. Uh, he knows a lot. And he's become a cog in the wheel. Uh, if the president wants to say, oh, uh, Russia has lost in Iran, uh, in, in Ukraine, well, Bill, uh, Bill Burns will say, oh, yes, sir. And besides that, the Russian armed forces have been shown to be as weak and corrupt as any armed forces in the world. Huh? It's just the opposite. So Bill Burns has become a little cog in the wheel. Let's say as an honest analyst somewhere in the bowels of the CIA, is he going to get promoted if he promotes a different idea, the kind that John Mearsheimer has? No, he won't. So the whole thing in intelligence is corrupt. Don't look to our analysis division for any, any sensible solutions or even views because they aren't there. They've been suppressed. It happened. It started with Bill Casey. I was there at the time. Bill Casey came in and he said, the Russians are responsible for all terrorism worldwide, aren't they? And we looked at them and we said, well, no, they're not. What did he do? He went to the Defense Intelligence Agency and got a little group, and they put out an estimate saying the Russians are responsible for all terrorism throughout the world. That's what he did. He got a, an acolyte in there named Robert Gates, and that was 1981, 85, and the whole analysis directorate was run by malleable managers who in turn promoted malleable managers. And when Bush and Cheney said, we want to attack Iraq, 
give us some evidence to justify it. They whomped up some crazy evidence about weapons of mass destruction, ties with Al Qaeda. Yeah, it's it couldn't be worse. And if I say this with a, a lot of anger, it's also with a lot of sadness because it was a reputable uh, uh, profession in my day, at least in Soviet analysis. Our leaders really were interested in what we thought the, the Russians wanted. And uh, I had a role in, in arms control when we told uh, Nixon and Kissinger that the Russians were really interested in arms control. And uh, if they played the Chinese off against the Russians, well, it's likely to result in some really good arms control treaties, which happened. That was sort of the acme of my career. I was in Moscow in the SALT Treaty when the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, was signed because I had worked on that and so had my branch. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of good that the CIA can do. I don't know if that's the case anymore. I doubt it, given what I see of Bill Burns and others. Um, one, one little other thing. There's a superstructure now called the National Intelligence Director, okay? Director of National Intelligence. So she, her name is Avril Haynes. She sits over the CIA, DIA, or all, all 17, can you believe it? Intelligence agencies, okay? Now, what did she say in her wisdom just one year ago? We are very much optimistic about the counteroffensive that Ukraine is mounting this spring. Uh, the Russians are running out of ammunition. They have no indigenous capability to produce the ammunition they need. We're looking at a pretty optimistic outlook for 2023. Her words in public. I assume she was telling Biden the same thing in private. Again, they couldn't be. They're exactly 180 degrees. It's the U.S. and Ukraine and NATO's run out of ammunition. And, uh, you know, it's the Russians that have the incredible production capability, not only to produce more troops, but to produce more weaponry of a sophisticated kind that even our president has admitted there's no defense against. So we're in a prickle. We're <laughs> in a really bad place here if you talk about intelligence. If you want real information, well, look to John Mearsheimer, look to Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, you could read raymcgovern.com. Um, my son who runs my website really uh, gets very angry if I don't mention that. I put everything on there and old as I am, I still remember some stuff and sometimes it's relevant. So yeah, uh, I have to tell you that uh, the State Department is totally corrupt. So is the CIA. There's nobody able to say anything reasonable, even if they're able to reason to it by virtue of their own intelligence. It's pretty frightening. And let me just conclude on one point though, because Henry Kissinger died recently. And you actually were an advisor uh, to President Nixon and then Ford and then Ronald Reagan, who somebody, I don't know, actually, I interviewed both Nixon, but I got to know Reagan even before he was governor and before he was president. And uh, the, the fact is, those guys look pretty good compared to where we are. <laughs> no, really, I mean, I know people are going to tear my head off for saying this. But I, you know, Nixon was able, actually Nixon deserved, I think, the credit for the opening to China, which is now both Trump and Biden that wanted to close down. It was, uh, and Kissinger certainly supported it. I give Nixon more credit because he actually wrote about it in Foreign Affairs magazine before he even met Kissinger, that we should be able to reach out to China and exploit the Sino-Soviet dispute, that communism was not monolithic. And we did have arms control. And, you know, and Ronald Reagan met with Gorbachev and they had, you know, an understanding it would be good to get rid of nuclear weapons. Those look like the good old days now. And even, you know, yes, Vietnam was this terrible war, you know, but at least they understood to try to put some limits on it. Now we're in a situation where, you know, one of those limits is that you were not taking on a nuclear power. Now we have just wild abandon. You know, let's provoke them. Let's put the stick in the eye of the bear. So I'm asking you mm -hmm. a final question. Are you more afraid about the future of humanity 
than ever before? Or do you think there's a bright spot? What is it? Bright spot. Um, well, let me, let me mention two possible bright spots that appeared just in the last few days. One is that uh, for some reason, the U.S. Navy was ordered to bring the USS General Ford back to Norfolk out of harm's way. Now, not many people know that. Uh, am I talking about straw in the wind? Yeah, that's a straw in the wind. Number two, the Israelis announced they're pulling out several brigades out of Gaza. Straw in the wind? Yeah. Does it mean much? Well, together they might mean something. So that's all I have have to offer with respect to good points. Now, bad points? They're galore. You mentioned, well, let me go back to President Kennedy, who was responsible for getting me down from Fordham to, uh, to, the, to briefing the White House eventually. Um, you know, he made a big point in that June 10 speech, 1963. I had just joined the agency. He said, look, what we never want to do is face another nuclear power with a choice between humiliating defeat and using nuclear weapons. Okay, does that make sense? Of course it makes sense, all right? Now, what about now? Well, as you point out, Robert, we are now engaged in a war with a nuclear power, and Russia is not losing. Russia is winning hands down in Ukraine, and that will become obvious to even the New York Times in the next month or two, okay? So, what am I worried about? <laughs> I'm worried about what Biden might decide to do. Now, uh, it's going to be a humiliating defeat on the part of the United States, Ukraine, and NATO. Are they going to say, oh, darn, uh, that was a bad idea. Uh, Russia won. I don't think so. The, the mentality is what else we got, okay? Two months ago, uh, President Biden says, hey, Secretary uh, Austin, uh, I hear the Ukrainians are running out of 155 millimeter shells. So let's give them some bars. And he says, well, sir, <laughs> sorry, but uh, we've given them a lot and they keep shooting them up. And uh, actually, we don't have any more. What else we got? Well, we have these cluster ammunition. We have the cluster shells that we don't, you know, lots of, oh, well, give them those. So we give them those, okay? Now, the war is coming to an end with the Russians winning. Now, what's Biden going to say now? What do we do now? And uh, not Milley, but Austin and the new chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff say, well, we don't, we don't have any more 155 millimeter shells, neither do the Europeans. And, you know, we can't even get any more money from Congress. So what? Okay, so what do we do? Well, up there on the the top shelf there, right underneath the 155 millimeter cluster ammunition, those are the mini nukes. Okay. Now, that, those are the ones that have the padlock on it. We, I know the combination. Okay. Let's use a, a mini nuke. Uh, that'll show the Russians we really mean business and, and we won't be seen to have lost the war uh, before the election next year. Now, why do I think that that crazy idea might have currency? because there's a personal stake in this for Biden, for Blinken, for Hunter Biden, and for Sullivan. What do I mean? <laughs> I think you know what I mean. If they lose the war, then they're going to lose the election. If they lose the election and that other guy comes in, they could actually lose their freedom. They could go to jail. I know enough about what's available in court documents and testimony to Congress to show that not only Hunter, uh, but Joe, Uncle Joe, his dad, and Blinken and Sullivan have played fast and loose with the law so that they could end up in jail. So what am I saying here? They have a personal incentive. History is replete with examples with, with people in power having personal incentives to do crazy things to fend off threats to their own political life and their own freedom. So if I'm now, it doesn't matter what I think, if 
if I'm right, and my job for 30 years was to put myself in the shoes of Soviet or Russian leaders, uh, if I'm right, then Putin is looking on this. He's riding high in Ukraine. He's exploiting the, the, the uh, troubles in the Middle East. Uh, and so what's he going to do? Is he feeling sort of, well, he's feeling his oats, but he's got to worry. He's got to worry about what these guys might do. Mini nukes? Like, oh, yeah, they're only about a tenth of the size of what we dropped on Hiroshima, you know? Okay. So if I'm Putin, I'm going to be talking to my military advisors. I'm going to say, wow, what would they do to avoid a, a clear defeat? And the military advisors say, we don't know about intentions. We don't care about intent. We care about capabilities. They can do this. So my my notion is that Putin, despite all his recent bravado, and despite saying, you know, the U.S. has now turned into not a partner, but an enemy, and we got him by the short hairs in Ukraine, despite that, he's got to be very, very sensitive to what these guys, Biden, Blinken, Sullivan, and Nolan might do to stave off defeat in Ukraine, defeat in the election, and possible personal ramifications if that other guy comes in and is as vindictive as many people think he would be, after all, he has lots of cause to be vindictive. So I'm going to wrap this up, but for people who aren't, uh, people think about foreign policy and diplomacy, everything is a very rational, uh, precise, scientific uh, subject. And, you know, we used to have analysis, uh, you know, uh, about winnable nuclear war and what you can do and so forth. Well, you've just opened the curtain to madness, absolute madness, and people out of personal ego and stupidity and arrogance uh, destroying, really, life. And and uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a frightening image, but you've been up close uh, to power. And I just want to end this by saying, you know, as a journalist, I witnessed the limits or the restraints on journalism. At the end of the day, I had to listen to what people were telling me and write it down. I had to ask questions. But it was Moish Diane or Alone in the West Bank or whether I believed them when they said, uh, you know, no, we're not going to be here. You come back in 10 years. We can't occupy a people and still have our identity. Obviously, we can't turn this into a prison. Camp. Well, it was turned into a prison campaign. And the whole memory of that old Labor Party, more idealistic Israel is gone. Now we have no power and control. And the interesting thing is Nixon came over was around Nixon. It was sort of an idea of the madman theory, which we've just revisited with you just now, that, that you have to show that you can go crazy, that you can do terrible things. Maybe this is what Netanyahu is about. Maybe this is what Biden will be about. And there really is no answer to that. It's just nuttiness. And it's uncontrollable. Yeah, hey, Robert, let me mention that there's an incredible documentary called The Movement and the Madman. Okay. When I say incredible, it's hard to believe that a movement such as we've been used to in the past was able to deprive the madman from doing really stupid things in Vietnam. The madman was going to be Richard Nixon. He talked with Kissinger. This has all come out now in confidential documents. He and Nixon and Kissinger were planning this madman theory where they would give Hanoi the idea that we were going to use nuclear weapons to finish this damn war. 1967, okay? It was all planned. And what happened? A million demonstrators in Central Park. Hundreds of thousands of other demonstrators. And we know from these documents that have been released, that turned the tide. What Nixon wanted to do with Kissinger agreeing was move troops up into North Vietnam to the border of China. Now, you'll remember, you're older than I am, you remember what happened last time we went all the way to the border of China and Korea, right? Okay, so that's what he wanted to do. And he wanted to threaten that he was going to nuclear, nuclear he was going to nuke the North, North Vietnamese. So it was the demonstrations that prevented that. And that's documentary now. And it's in this wonderful video. 
It's called the Madman and the Movement, or vice versa, the Movement and the Madman. I suggest everyone get a hold of it. It's online. It's it's on, in the internet, and you can okay. get a copy. Okay. Where is it? You're selling one since you mentioned RayMcGovern.com. Oh yeah, my well, I do a lot of tweeting now on X, and that's at Ray McGovern. And a day later, uh, all of these things plus more, my lectures and so forth, they will appear on raymcgovern.com. That's our website. My son who runs it says that I should add, if you don't get it, you don't get it. But I'm too humble to say that, Robert. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I didn't know that I would spend this much time in my life with a guy from Fordham University, but I guess you had some major intellectuals there and uh, got some things right. So from an old city college guy. Thanks for doing this, Ray. And it's I, my pleasure, I, Robert. I hope our pessimism Truly. is all wrong, but. Uh...